Book One, Sections Twenty Four through Twenty Six of King Cole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. King Cole by Upton Sinclair. Book One, The Domain of King Cole. Section Twenty Four. The time came for Mary to take her departure, and Hal got up, wincing with pain, to escort her home. She regarded him gravely having not realized before how seriously he was suffering. As they walked along she asked, "'Why do you do such work when you don't have to?' "'But I do have to. I have to earn a living.' "'You don't have to earn it that way. A bright young fellow like you, an American?' "'Well,' said Hal, "'I thought it would be interesting to see coal-mining.' "'Now you've seen it,' said the girl. "'Now quit.' "'But it won't do me any harm to go on for a while.' "'Won't it? How can ye know, when any day they may carry you out on a plank?' Her company manner was gone. Her voice was full of bitterness, as it always was when she spoke of North Valley. "'I know what I'm telling ye, Joe Smith. Didn't I lose two brothers in it? As fine lads as ye'd find anywhere in the world. And many another lad I've seen go in laughing and come out a corpse.' or what is worse for working people, a cripple. Sometimes I'd like to go and stand at the pit mouth in the morning and cry to them, Go back, go back, go down the canyon this day, starve if you have to, beg if you have to, only find some other work but coal mining. Her voice had risen to a passion of protest. When she went on, a new note came into it, a note of personal terror. It's worse now since she came, Joe. To see ye settin' out on the life of a miner, you that are young and strong and different, oh, go away, Joe, go away while ye can. He was astonished at her intensity. Don't worry about me, Mary, he said. Nothing will happen to me. I'll go away after a while. The path was irregular, and he had been holding her arm as they walked. He felt her trembling, and went on again quickly. It's not I that should go away, Mary. It's yourself. You hate the place. It's terrible for you to have to live here. Have you never thought of going away? She did not answer at once, and when she did the excitement was gone from her voice. It was flat and dull with despair. "'Tis no use to think of me. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing any girl can do when she's poor. I've tried, but tis like being up against a stone wall. I can't even save the money to get on a train with. I've tried it. I've been saving for two years. And how much do you think I got, Joe? Seven dollars. Seven dollars in two years. No, you can't save money in a place where there's so many things that wring the heart. You may hate them for being cowards, but ye must help when ye see a man killed and his family turned out without a roof to cover them in the winter time. You're too tender-hearted, Mary. No, tis not that. Should I go off and leave me own brother and sister that need me? But you could earn money and send it to them. I earn a little here. I do cleanin' and nursin' for some that need me. But outside, couldn't you earn more? I could get a job in a restaurant for seven or eight a week, but I'd have to spend more, and what I sent home would not go so far, with me away. Or I could get a job in some other woman's home and work fourteen hours a day for it. But, Joe, tis not more drudgery I want. Tis something fair to look upon, something of my own. She flung out her arms suddenly like one being stifled. Oh, I want something that's fair and clean. Again he felt her trembling. Again the path was rough, and having an impulse of sympathy, he put his arm about her. In the world of leisure one might indulge in such considerateness, and he assumed it would not be different with a miner's daughter. But then, when she was close to him, he felt, rather than heard, a sob. Mary, he whispered, and they stopped. Almost without realizing it, he put his other arm about her, and in a moment more he felt her warm breath on his cheek, and she was trembling and shaking in his embrace. Joe, Joe! she whispered, you take me away. She was a rose in a mining camp, and Hal was deeply moved. The primrose path of dalliance stretched fair before him. 
here in the soft summer night, with a moon overhead which bore the same message as it bore in the Italian gardens of the leisure class. But not many minutes passed before a cold fear began to steal over Hal. There was a girl at home, waiting for him, and also there was the resolve which had been growing in him since his coming to this place, a resolve to find some way of compensation to the poor, to repay them for the freedom and culture he had taken, not to prey upon them, upon any individual among them. There were the Jeff Cottons for that. "'Mary,' he pleaded, "'we mustn't do this.' "'Why not?' "'Because I'm not free. There is someone else.' He felt her start, but she did not draw away. "'Where?' she asked in a low voice. "'At home, waiting for me.' "'And why didn't you tell me?' "'I don't know.' Hal realized in a moment that the girl had ground of complaint against him. According to the simple code of her world, he had gone some distance with her. He had been seen to walk out with her. He had been accounted her fellow. He had led her to talk to him of herself. He had insisted upon having her confidences. And these people who were poor did not have subtleties. There was no room in their lives for intellectual curiosities, for platonic friendships or philanderings. "'Forgive me, Mary,' he said. She made no answer, but a sob escaped her, and she drew back from his arms, slowly. He struggled with an impulse to clasp her again. She was beautiful, warm with life, and so much in need of happiness. But he held himself in check, and for a minute or two they stood apart. Then he asked humbly, "'We can still be friends, Mary, can't we? You must know I'm so sorry.' But she could not endure being pitied. "'Tis nothing,' she said. "'Only I thought I was going to get away. That's what you mean to me.' End of section 24 Section 25 Hal had promised Alex Stone to keep a lookout for troublemakers, and one evening the boss stopped him on the street and asked him if he had anything to report. Hal took the occasion to indulge his sense of humor. "'There's no harm in Mike Sicoria, said he. He likes to shoot off his head, but if he's got somebody to listen, that's all he wants. He's just old and grouchy. But there's another fellow that I think would bear watching. Who's that? asked the boss. I don't know his last name. They call him Gus, and he's a cager, fellow with a red face. I know, said Stone. Gus Durking. Well, he tried his best to get me to talk about unions. He keeps bringing it up, and I think he's some kind of troublemaker. I see, said the boss. I'll get after him. You won't say I told you, said Hal, anxiously. Oh, no, sure not. And Hal caught the trace of a smile on the pit boss's face. He went away, smiling in his turn. The red-faced feller, Gus, was the person Madvik had named as being a spotter for the company. There were ins and outs to this matter of spotting, and sometimes it was not easy to know what to think. One Sunday morning Hal went for a walk up the canyon, and on the way he met a young chap who got to talking with him, and after a while brought up the question of working conditions in North Valley. He had only been there a week, he said, but everybody he had met seemed to be grumbling about short weight. He himself had a job as an outside man, so it made no difference to him, but he was interested and wondered what Hal had found. Straightway came the question, was this really a working man, or had Alec Stone set someone to spying upon his spy? This was an intelligent fellow, an American, which in itself was suspicious, for most of the new men the company got in were from somewhere east of Suez. Hal decided to spar for a while. He did not know, he said, that conditions were any worse here than elsewhere. You heard complaints no matter what sort of job you took. Yes, said the stranger, but matters seemed to be especially bad in the coal camps. 
Probably it was because they were so remote, and the companies owned everything in sight. "'Where have you been?' asked Hal, thinking that this might trap him. But the other answered straight. He had evidently worked in half a dozen of the camps. In Mateo he had paid a dollar a month for wash-house privileges, and there had never been any water after the first three men had washed. There had been a common wash-tub for all the men, an unthinkably filthy arrangement. At Pine Creek, Hal found the very naming of the place made his heart stand still, at Pine Creek he had boarded with his boss, but the roof of the building leaked, and everything he owned was ruined. The boss would do nothing, yet when the boarder moved, he lost his job. At East Ridge, this man and a couple of other fellows had rented a two-room cabin and started to board themselves, in spite of the fact that they had to pay a dollar fifty a sack for potatoes and eleven cents a pound for sugar at the company store. They had continued until they made the discovery that the water supply had run short, and that the water for which they were paying the company a dollar a month was being pumped from the bottom of the mine, where the filth of mules and men was plentiful. Hal forced himself to remain non-committal. He shook his head and said it was too bad, but the workers always got it in the neck, and he didn't see what they could do about it. So they strolled back to the camp the stranger evidently baffled, and Hal, for his part, feeling like the reader of a detective story at the end of the first chapter. Was this young man the murderer, or was he the hero? One would have to read on in the book to find out. End of section 25 Section 26 Hal kept his eye upon his new acquaintance, and perceived that he was talking with others. Before long the man tackled old Mike, and Mike, of course, could not refuse an invitation to grumble, though it came from the devil himself. Hal decided that something must be done about it. He consulted his friend Jerry, who, being a radical, might have some touchstone by which to test the stranger. Jerry sought him out at noontime, and came back and reported that he was as much in the dark as Hal. Either the man was an agitator, seeking to start something, or else he was a detective sent in by the company. There was only one way to find out, which was for someone to talk freely with him and see what happened to that person. After some hesitation, Hal decided that he would be the victim. It reawakened his love of adventure, which digging in a coal mine had subdued in him. The mysterious stranger was a new sort of miner, digging into the souls of men. Hal would countermine him, and perhaps blow him up. He could afford the experiment better than some others, better, for example, than little Mrs. David, who had already taken the stranger into her home, and revealed to him the fact that her husband had been a member of the most revolutionary of all miners' organizations, the South Wales Federation. So next Sunday Hal invited the stranger for another walk. The man showed reluctance, until Hal said that he wanted to talk to him. As they walked up the canyon, Hal began, "'I've been thinking about what you said of conditions in these camps, and I've concluded it would be a good thing if we had a little shaking up here in North Valley. "'Is that so?' said the other. "'When I first came here, I used to think the men were grouchy, but now I've had a chance to see for myself, and I don't believe anybody gets a square deal. For one thing, nobody gets full weight in these mines, at least not unless he's some favorite of the boss. I'm sure of it, for I've tried all sorts of experiments with my partner, We've loaded a car extra light, and got eighteen hundred weight, and then we've loaded one high and solid, so that we'd know it had twice as much in it, but all we ever got was twenty-two and twenty-three. There's just no way you can get over that, though everybody knows those big cars can be made to hold two or three tons. Yes, I suppose they might, said the other. And if you get the smallest piece of rock in, you get a double O, sure as fate, and sometimes they say you got rock in when you didn't. There's no law to make them prove it. No, I suppose not. What it comes to is simply this. 
They make you think they are paying fifty-five a ton, but they've secretly cut you down to thirty-five. And yesterday at the company store I paid a dollar and a half for a pair of blue overalls that I'd priced in Pedro for sixty cents. Well, said the other, the company has to haul them up here, you know. So gradually Hal made the discovery that the tables were turned. The mysterious personage was now occupied in holding him at arm's length. For some reason, Hal's sudden interest in industrial justice had failed to make an impression. So his career as a detective came to an inglorious end. "'Say, man,' he exclaimed, "'what's your game, anyhow?' "'Game?' said the other, quietly. "'How do you mean?' "'I mean, what are you here for?' "'I'm here for two dollars a day, the same as you, I guess.' Hal began to laugh. You and I are like a couple of submarines, trying to find each other under water. I think we'd better come to the surface to do our fighting." The other considered the simile, and seemed to like it. "'You come first, said he, but he did not smile. His quiet blue eyes were fixed on Hal with deadly seriousness. "'All right,' said Hal. "'My story isn't very thrilling. I'm not an escaped convict, I'm not a company spy, as you may be thinking, nor am I a natural-born coal-miner. I happen to have a brother and some friends at home who think they know about the coal industry, and it got on my nerves, and I came to see for myself. That's all, except that I found things interesting and want to stay on a while, so I hope you aren't a dick." The other walked in silence, weighing Hal's words. That's not exactly what you'd call a usual story," he remarked at last. I know, replied Hal. The best I can say for it is that it's true. Well, said the stranger, I'll take a chance on it. I have to trust somebody, if I'm ever to get anywhere. I picked you out because I liked your face. He gave Hal another searching look as he walked. Your smile isn't that of a cheat. But you're young, so let me remind you of the importance of secrecy in this place." "'I'll keep mum,' said Hal, and the stranger opened a flap inside his shirt, and drew out a letter which certified him to be Thomas Olson, an organizer for the United Mine Workers, the great national union of the coal-miners. End of section 26